In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. And welcome to St. James's for our service for Easter for wherever you are. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. This is the week in which Boris Johnson and Carrie Simmons have welcomed their son into the new home of 10 Downing Street. Newly promoted Colonel Tom Moore has raised more than £30 million for the NHS. Sainsbury's have said that this pandemic may well have cost them £500 million. President Trump is investigating whether the Chinese state is responsible for COVID-19. And sadly, the list of those who have died gets longer and longer. So we've come together this morning to ask God to help us to make something of these hugely challenging times and to pray for every concern, every event, every disaster, knowing that we can't do anything about 99% of them. What we can do is to show that we care. We can turn our vague interest and concern into compassion and pray that our empathy will allow us to be tipped over the edge into a genuine love for those most deeply affected by the pandemic and all the other issues that we're thinking about today. To help us to do that, we're again drawing on the book Luminaries and the lives of two great Christian martyrs of the 20th century, Edith Stein and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We'll be looking at their stories in the light of today's gospel about Jesus being the Good Shepherd and the gatekeeper of the sheepfold. Spurred on by their example, there may be another way to understand this familiar passage from St John's Gospel. But before we begin, let's call to mind the presence of God wherever we are, thanking him for all that he has given in this week. Thanking him too for the fellowship of the church which links us not just to other members of St James's, but also with our fellow Christians around the world. And we start with our colleagues for this, the fourth Sunday of Easter. We pray together, God of the prophets, you fulfilled your promise that your son would suffer and then rise again. Grow in us a love of your word, that with power from on high, we may fill our days with praise and thanksgiving. Grant this through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. It was not long before the apostles had brought several thousand to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. The new converts continued to listen to the apostles' teaching and they soon formed themselves into groups where the word of God was explained, the bread was broken and prayers were offered. As the faith of the new disciples deepened, so their commitment grew. Many signs and wonders continued to be seen as the apostles continued their ministry. A sense of fellowship developed among the new believers. They held their property and their goods in common and sold what was not needed so that they could support those in need. After prayer in the temple, they broke bread in their homes, praising God for all that he had done for them, eating together with glad and generous hearts. They were warmly accepted in their communities and day by day the Lord added to those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My Lord is my shepherd and he will blaze a trail for me for he knows and understands my needs. He will take me where the grass grows lush and green and in the sparkling water he will wash my wounds and with him beside me my soul shall sing. He will lead me onward, sustaining me when my courage fails, and he will hold me safe when my footsteps falter, and with him beside me my soul shall sing. Even when the storm clouds gather and life looks grim, when the dark winds blow and I can no longer find my way, he will hold the light steady before me. With the strength of his hand he will protect me from all harm, and with him beside me my soul shall sing. How blessed am I that the Lord has called me. Alleluia, alleluia. I am the good shepherd, says the Lord. I know my sheep 
and my own know me. Alleluia. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Among his many miracles, Jesus had healed a man who had been born blind. Although he was delighted to be able to see again, the event had just got the man into serious trouble with the Pharisees, who could not believe that Jesus was capable of restoring the man's sight. The man had put up such a stout defence of Jesus, however, that after being cross-questioned, he had been thrown out of the synagogue for defying those in charge. When he heard about this, Jesus said, Do not be surprised by this. I have come into the world to act as a judge, so that the blind will be able to see. But those who can see will become blind. He then went on, Imagine a field where all the sheep are gathered safely into a sheep pen. To protect the sheep, there is only one way in and one way out, and the door is protected by the watchman. The sheep are safe because they know the voice of their shepherd. They listen for his voice, and when he calls them by name, they confidently leave the sheepfold and go wherever wherever he leads them. If anyone else tries to enter the sheepfold, they will have to find another way in, because they are just robbers and thieves who intent is to kill and harry the sheep. The sheep will not recognise their voice and will try to run away. Many who were listening did not understand what Jesus meant, so he said, I am the door of the sheepfold. Those who came before me were the thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, and whoever comes to me will safely go in and out of the sheepfold. But be aware of the thieves, whose only interest is to steal and destroy. I have come into the world so that you may have life, and have it to the full. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tell me, how are you feeling? How are you really feeling? As a young priest, I was often put in my place by people who were older or wiser than I was. I might be wearing a dog collar, but I had a lot to learn. And on one occasion, I made the mistake of saying to someone, I know how you're feeling, without missing a beat. She turned on me. Don't be stupid, she said. How could you possibly know how I feel? I can't remember the exact circumstances, but you can be sure I've never said that in the same way again. And yet, what is human flourishing about if we're not at least at some level trying to find out what other people are feeling, what they're seeing and what they're needing? Sister Sister Hilary Lyons was brought up in the very west of Ireland in the 1930s. As so many of her generation did, she entered a convent at the age of 18 and before being sent to the missions, in her case to Sierra Leone, she qualified as a doctor. In two short books, she tells the story of what it was like for a fresh-faced girl from County Mayo to be thrust into this colonial outpost in West Africa with absolutely no idea of what she was going to meet and armed only with her rudimentary medical training and her prayer books. The word that flows throughout the narrative of those 40 years is empathy, learning to feel and to understand people so very different from herself at the deepest level possible. It was an amazing story and an amazing journey. But it was often very painful too trying to see things from someone else's perspective. On one occasion, full of biblical rectitude, Sister Hilary persuaded a man to get rid of two of his three wives in a culture where polygamy was long established. The tale she tells is heartbreaking as we learn how the women and their children were banished from the village and then reduced to abject poverty. Hilary had simply failed to understand the way in which families worked in rural Sierra Leone. In today's Gospel, Jesus uses the picture of the shepherd and the sheepfold to tease out something we can so easily overlook, the connection between security and true empathy. Let's start with the bits that are familiar. 
The picture Jesus gives us is of some sheep literally penned up. The world is full of people, robbers and thieves, who want to prize the sheep out of their safe haven and kill them. The best place, the safest place for them to be is therefore inside the sheepfold. It's not much fun being cooped up, but at least they're safe. But as we all know too well, in this period of isolation, they aren't free. And so they spend their time listening out for the voice of the familiar shepherd calling them from outside the sheepfold. As soon as they hear his voice, things change. They know that if they leave where they are, they will be still be looked after, but they will be free to go and explore the world too. Isn't that what life is really all about? Yet as Jesus tells the story, we're bound to ask, given the thieves and the robbers, even with Jesus leading them, are they really safe outside that sheepfold? In the book Luminaries that some of us are reading by the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams reflects on two more victims of the Nazi regime in the 1940s. Edith Stein and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one a Jewish Christian nun and the other a Lutheran pastor. We thought about a third victim, Etty Hillesum, last week, and there's a bit of each of their stories which interlink. But Edith Stein, her deep interest in what other people were doing and what they were thinking stemmed from much more than just interest. She was fascinated by what made people tick, and she found that the more she understood them, the more she loved them. Like Sister Hilary in Sierra Leone, she couldn't stop herself trying to work out what led people to talk in the way that they did and to make decisions in the way that they did. Brought up in the German philosophical tradition, this line of inquiry took her closer and closer to what she called the edge. It was, she said, as if she was standing on a cliff. If she went any further in understanding people, she would literally fall over. And then what would she find? What was there over the edge? To Edith Stein, over that edge was the place where we find God. Only when we put our own interests to one side, abandon our control of the situation and discovered how to fully love other people, will we discover the overwhelming presence of God. Stein believed that it was only when we were in complete empathy with the needs and desires of others, being in one heart and mind, as the early Christians described it in our first reading from Acts, that the face of God will be revealed and the voice of the Good Shepherd be heard. She wrote, There was a universal need for sympathy and help beyond the narrow circle of friends and family, rooted in the divine love for all, who suffer and are overburdened. But first one had to take the risk of leaving behind the security of the sheepfold. The sheepfold, far from being a haven we might all long for, represented a false retreat, a place of selfishness and immaturity. Jesus the Good Shepherd called from outside its walls and his promise was not to provide total protection from harm, but a journey of discovery in which he remained a constant presence, however hard the experiences that we might have to then cope with. And it was this conviction that led Edith Stein to her greatest test. Because despite the risks, the more she grew in love for her fellow Jews, the more determined she was not to use her Christian faith to evade the SS or the dreaded deportation order when it finally came. Indeed, as Etty Hillesum wrote in a letter, the sight of Edith Stein and her sister Gertrude dressed in full nun's habits, caring for the other prisoners in a Jewish transit camp, made a deep impression on her. It was there in Vesterborg, that Edith had fallen over the edge and found her true vocation caring for those destined for Auschwitz.
the part of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, there was an equally stark choice. As war loomed in 1939, this brilliant young man was teaching in New York. Already out of favour with the Nazis, he could so easily have stayed put in the United States and escaped all the turmoils his countrymen were going through. But in his heart, he knew what the image of the Good Shepherd was really about. He couldn't remain in the United States and turn his back on suffering, nor could he stand idly by. By August of that year, he'd sailed back to Germany and to a deep involvement with those opposed to fascism. This is how the truth makes you free, he wrote in his diary. Not free to do whatever we fancy at any given moment, but free to be real. It's the freedom to be what we most deeply are. Now, I know that this isn't the way that we ne normally think about these words of Jesus about being the good shepherd. The idea that safe in his sheepfold, we will be kept from harm and from the wolves who are out to get us. But actually, I think what Jesus wants us to do is to take in the very opposite of that safety first message. What he's inviting us to do is to take risks to venture outside our comfort zones, to go to the extra mile in caring for people on their own, to take the difficult decision at work that may lead to something really important emerging, perhaps giving more than we can afford to a charity which looks to us for help, and all the time knowing that Jesus will be there in the middle of those challenges to give us what we need when the going gets tough. The truth is that Whatever we, whenever we listen faithfully to the voice of Jesus, we really have no idea where his call will take us. Once we've left the security of the sheepfold and what we find familiar, Mayo for Hilary Lyons, the convent life for Edith Stein, or New York for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we find ourselves being led closer and closer to the edge where our empathy and love for other people reveals the face and the love of God, but often through experiences that we would prefer to avoid. Here in the lives of these three extraordinary people, it was their willingness to go wherever Jesus led, which gave true meaning to their lives and turned their curiosity into compassion and their compassion into love the place where they could find the truth of God for themselves. And Jesus' offer, of course, remains the same. Whether it's the early disciples in the book of Acts, those 20th century men and women of faith, or to us, he remains the truly empathetic good shepherd who leads us out into pastures new. For as he said, have come into the world so that you may have life and have it to the full. Or as the psalm says, and with him beside me, my soul shall sing. And so let me remind you of our collect, God of the prophets. You fulfilled your promise that your son would suffer and then rise again, grow in us a love for your word, that with power from on high we may fill our days with praise and thanksgiving. Grant this through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And now we're going to do something slightly different we haven't done before. We're going to invite Adam to play a piece of Bach for us, the Saraband from the Partita number no. 1 in B-flat. Thank you.
As a sign of our solidarity with Christians throughout the world, we say together, we believe in God the Father who created all things, for by his will they were created and have their being. We believe in God the Son who was killed, for by his blood he earned forgiveness for every tribe and language, for every people and nation. We believe in God the Holy Spirit who teaches us God's truth, we believe, believe in, in one God, God Father, Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Many of us are parents or teachers, and we know that empathy is largely caught, not taught. So these words. If a child lives with criticism, it learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, it learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, it learns to be shy. If a child lives with shame, it learns to be guilty. But if a child lives with tolerance, it learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, it learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, it learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, it learns justice. If a child lives with security, it learns to have faith. If a child lives with approval, it learns to like itself. If a child lives with acceptance and friendship, it learns to find love in the world. And so in the light of those words, let us call to mind our sin. Lord Jesus, forgive us that our need for security blinds us to the plight of so many in our community. Forgive us for shutting our ears and our eyes to the needs of those who do not enjoy what we so easily take for granted. Forgive us for our complacency and our lack of love. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. us. Lord Jesus, when the tests of life come, forgive us for not relying on your saving help. Forgive us for not setting time aside to listen to your voice, for not reading your word of life in the Bible or praying for others. While our church buildings are closed, forgive us for carrying on with our daily lives as if nothing has changed. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. And so may the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may enjoy the glory of God and live in his presence all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so this morning, our prayers. As we seek to be empathetic, to reach out to one another in love and compassion, we remember the words of St Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, where there's hatred, let me so love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Heavenly Father, in this pandemic, we pray for all those who are most vulnerable in our society, for the residents and staff in our care homes and geriatric wards, for district nurses and for paramedics working in the community. 
We pray for all those who are worried about the lack of breathing support and for those ensuring that frontline professionals are properly supplied with PPE. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the four governments within the United Kingdom, for their respective chief medical officers and scientific committees, for those engaged in trials for a new vaccine. We pray for COBRA and for those balancing medical needs with the support of our economy. We continue to pray for workers furloughed or made redundant, those not able to work and those with no income. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all those volunteering to support the isolated and the poor. We pray for the success of the local food banks and for all those donating food and vital supplies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our children and our university students who are unable to take part in full-time education. For parents taking on unfamiliar teaching roles, especially those technically working from home. We pray for young people in cramped living conditions and for those suffering mental or physical abuse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We hold before God all those who need our prayers, amongst our families and friends and those for whom we regularly pray. And we commend to God the souls of Robert Addington, Rose Baker and Howard Allen, who have died recently, and for Kathleen Palmer, Doris Akehurst, Jean Vanier, and all whose anniversaries fall this week. And so we join with Christians the world over as we say together, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, shepherd and friend, you understand our need for security and our longing for reassurance that all will be well. As we understand our own vulnerability and our need to be loved, may it deepen our capacity to feel for others. Enlarge our souls, expand our minds and soften our hearts, that with compassion and empathy we may do your work in the world. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so to the notices, well, there's not a great deal to share with you today, except, of course, we've had two funerals. Um, the first one was for a West Indian family. So we had a boombox uh, by the graveside and they played reggae music and some evangelical songs from West, uh, the West Indies, which was quite fun. But the next day was the funeral for Robert Addington. Um, Robert, of course, at 94, a great member of St. James's for very many years. Um, as it happened, only his son, Matt, and Matt's partner were able to be there. Um, but right at the end, on a mobile phone, they played the music from Purcell's uh, funeral for Queen Mary. And actually in that kind of parkland at Cock Foster's, um, it was very moving too. So I'm delighted that actually the Church of England can actually care for people in this kind of way. That's what we're about. So even if we're not desperately busy doing some of the things that we normally do, um, those two occasions were really very important indeed. But I wanted to share with you some of the kind of craft work that's been going on with our young people over the last few weeks. Um, 
this first one is actually meeting Jesus on the Emmaus Road. So that was two weeks ago. And uh, that was the card that they made, which is beautiful. Um, the second one is actually really quite ingenious. So um, meeting Jesus in the upper room when he appears through the door. Um, so there he is. And when they believed, there is Jesus appearing out of nowhere. And then this third one, when we've been talking about sheep and sheepfold, um, in a slightly different way with the kids, but nevertheless, there they go. There's Jesus on the door, and there's the doorkeeper, and there's the sheep. Um, so they've had great fun, I hope, making that this weekend too. So as always, we end up by saying thank you. Thank you to Susan and Nicola and Matt for reading, to Adam for playing the piano for the first time from his home, uh, in Southgate and it's been great to have him doing that and of course always thank you to Sinead for doing all the technical stuff which makes it possible for us to share this with you. So I hope you have a very good week. It's been uh, as always um, my pleasure to be able to share some of these ideas with you today and if you've got any feedback of course I'm delighted to hear from you but for now let's ask God's blessing before we leave. Living God Grant us faith to follow where you might lead, courage to step out into the unknown, grace to walk with humility, and a commitment not to grow weary, but to travel on until our work for you is done. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us now and forever. Amen. Amen.